Hello. Welcome to the first TSC Economics Research Seminar of the fall term uh, 2022. My name is uh, Timo Kosmanen, and uh, I will be speaking today about the misallocation of labor and capital in Finland's business sector. So uh, this presentation is based on the recent uh, uh, report that we that we my my research group did for the for the Prime Minister's Office of Finland. So it was published in end of May, and here is the here is the little bit of information about this uh, this final report. So I'm going to talk mainly about uh, chapters two, three, five, and six, uh, which were co-authored with uh, Sheng Dai from Aalto University and Natalia Korsmanen from from Etla. And although this uh, this um, report for the Prime Minister's Office has already been published. Uh, this work is still very much uh, um, topical for, for us uh, authors because uh, our next uh, task uh, and the next objective is to prepare uh, a couple of um, journal papers based on these uh, materials that we have published in this, in this report. So this work is still uh, very much uh, going on further. So here's the outline of my of my talk. So I will start first with a little bit of, of uh, background and motivation, why we are interested in this uh, misallocation. Uh, then our, about our research strategy and contributions. And then I will uh, provide some empirical evidence and then uh, briefly conclude and, and discuss some avenues of uh, further research. So first of all, about the background. So. As you probably know, there has been a lot of interest in this and a lot of discussion about the secular stagnation, and not only here in Finland, but, uh, but also in most of the, of the Western countries. So here in this diagram, I have depicted the, the real GDP per capita in Finland from, uh, from mid 1970s to, till the, the latest uh, year available. And, uh, in the in the in the past decades, uh, the the standards of living were of course uh, rising mainly thanks to the to the productivity growth. But uh, since the financial crisis uh, that started in the USA, and then there was of course resulting uh, euro crisis or European debt crisis, uh, and in the past few years, of course. Uh, we have uh, been uh, moving from one crisis to another. There was the COVID crisis. There was uh, the invasion of Russia to Ukraine and the resulting energy crisis here in Europe. Uh, uh, so um, since over the past uh, 15 years or so, there have been some fluctuations in the, in the real GDP per capita, but, uh, but uh, uh, virtually no, no growth. So we are stuck in the same level as, as we were before the financial crisis. Uh, and uh, the question of course is how do we, how do we get this kind of, uh, kind of uh, growth in the future? And therefore, uh, before we can give any kind of uh, policy advice, uh, it's very important, first of all, to understand the underlying reasons that what has led to this kind of stagnation, particularly what has led to the stagnation of the productivity growth, because that's of course the, the key issue here. So as I mentioned, it's not only here in Finland, but also in other, other Western countries. So um, over the past uh, decade or so, there has been a lot of uh, uh, different explanations that economists have suggested for the stagnant productivity growth. And on this slide, I have, I have uh, outlined some of, the, some of the explanations. There is of course much more and, uh, and the discussion of what, which explanations are really the important ones is still going on today. So firstly, I want to point out that there have been some empirical work uh, suggesting uh, that the business dyna dynamism has been uh, declining, uh, meaning firm entry, uh, job, job creation or job turnover. And uh, this is both in the, in the USA and, and, and also here in, here in Europe, which can be uh, leading to this kind of slower, slower productivity. Another interesting uh, line of research, uh, mainly attributed to Jan de Locker et al. and his research group, uh, suggests that there have been rising markups 
which also further suggests that there has been market power and or market power of firms has been increasing. And this can also then this has been also connected to the to the productivity slowdown. If if firms are um, abusing their market power more and more, this also can can explain this kind of uh, observed phenomenon that, for example, uh, share of capital in the in the functional distribution of income has been increasing at the cost of labor. So these kind of explanations, like like this. Uh, declining business dynamism and, and uh, rising markups then can contribute to the misallocation of resources. So this, uh, this uh, interest in misallocation of resources uh, um, took uh, or started uh, or, or revived from this work of C. N. Klenov in 2009. So originally this misallocation studies were mainly focusing on, uh, on uh, developing countries versus USA but uh, but uh, now during this uh, stagnation in the in the western countries there has been also uh, also suggested that perhaps this misallocation of resources might have something to do with the with the with the uh, declining productivity and it might be related to these first two explanations that i suggested also as well so if there is market power it might also for example then lead to this uh, kind of inefficient allocation now then some authors, uh, most notably Robert Gordon and then more recently Nick Bloom and, and co-authors have suggested that uh, new ideas are harder to find over time that uh, as, as this kind of uh, um, uh, previous innovations have already been utilized. So it's, it's uh, increasingly more difficult to, to, to generate some genuinely uh, new innovations, which would further then boost uh, boost uh, productivity growth, and uh, they provide some evidence about declining uh, declining innovation productivity. That that R and D expenditures have been increasing, but the patent rate of patenting has been uh, not uh, keeping up to this uh, level of increasing R and D expenditures. Now, then there's another type of explanation refers to all types of measurement issues, for example, in terms of the, the digital economy, which often provides also, also free goods. Uh, think, for example, uh, different types of mobile apps that we have, we can, we can use uh, free of charge. So there is, uh, for example, Bryn Jolson and, and co-authors have, have studied that and also suggested some, some ways to improve uh, uh, measurement of value added to account this kind of kind of free goods and uh, improved quality of services, which we might uh, uh, might miss in this conventional measures of uh, of economic activity. Then there is also a plethora of other other reasons. Of course, we we know that there's been uh, issues of aging society and uh, uh, relatively massive retirement of baby boom generation at the, at the, at this time period. Uh, there is, of course, also zero interest rates, um, the rise of China, in, in especially in manufacturing, and so on and so on. So, my this list is by far, I mean, no, by no means it is uh, entirely uh, exhaustive uh, list of potential explanations. But so, what what is then our our study? What can we say? Uh, regarding these potential explanations, so so we have something something related to these different types of explanations. So so the project was focusing on this misallocation, but but we have also some other other potential explanations having in mind. So first of all, our research question is that is the allocation of labor and capital in Finland's business sector efficient? If not, then how much could better allocation potentially increase productivity? Uh, but I will also discuss if, they, if we find any signs of market power and uh, what about the uh, allocation uh, over time? Is it improving or deteriorating? And also I'll comment about the measurement issues. So in case that I will run out of, out of time towards the end, I have also then prepared some preview of main results that I, I'll, I'll discuss before I go more to the technicalities. So regarding the first question, we find that uh, 
that uh, that uh, actually the current allocation seems to be a far cry from the optimal allocation and i will discuss you i will discuss shortly that what do we mean by the optimal allocation here now then how much we could potentially increase productivity by better allocation so we have studied 16 different industries eight from uh, from manufacturing and eight from service industries and uh, based on our results the the potential increase is not just marginal it would be it would be we talk about two digit uh, uh, percentage increases in in different sectors if not like like hundreds of percent in some sectors so there would be a huge potential to increase uh, um, output and productivity if only the resources were better and more efficiently allocated between the firms now of course, then market power and, and rise of market power is this uh, potential uh, explanation why there is this kind of kind of misallocation. And indeed, we, we do find some kind of uh, uh, evidence of systematic capital bias. So it seems to be it seems to us that the misallocation of labor is correlated with the, with the four factors such as firm age, firm size, leverage, and and foreign ownership. So uh, this at least uh, provide some kind of tentative uh, suggestion that perhaps indeed uh, this uh, misallocation may be, may be uh, not just uh, purely random, but it may be associated with the, with the market power. It also also the fact that, that there is, uh, there is uh, systematic capital bias, meaning over, over capacity, which, which could be also like hinting towards uh, market power. Now, what about the dynamics? Is allocation improving or deteriorating? Unfortunately, we find evidence that allocation is deteriorating over time, which is uh, which is a, um, a bit worrying. And finally, what about the measurement issue? So there has been attention on the digital economy. So in fact, in our project, we also suggest another type of measurement issue, which the conventional measures of labor productivity and total factor productivity might be overlooking. Namely, we, we observe quite sharp decrease in the greenhouse gas emissions, which is of course a good thing and desirable property because uh, we need to decrease emissions to, to um, mitigate the impacts of climate change. But of course, in terms of productivity, if, if the conventional um, measures of value added uh, they do not take into account this, uh, this decrease in, in carbon emissions. However, a lot of resources, particularly there has been massive capital investments to, to decrease the emissions, which, which might explain that, that, that uh, uh, apparently the, the, the inputs to production are increasing, but output doesn't increase as so, or output uh, increase doesn't take into account this. Uh, um progress in terms of uh, uh, carbon abatement so this could be another uh, important uh, explanation for this uh, for this uh, declining productivity so let's get to a little bit more in details so what is our research strategy so we will follow this uh, this um cn Klenov approach to, to study misallocation. However, we split the, the, our examination in two parts. So we, first of all, we start with the comparison of marginal products and, and uh, marginal costs. And there we also we, we apply a bit more data-driven estimation of marginal products, taking into account this larger uh, productivity dispersion between firms. Then after this comparison, uh, we, will, we will then uh, compare how much the, the economic output could potentially increase. And there we form the counterfactual as uh, using the um, optimization methods, which could be th thought of as this kind of social planners um, optimization problem. And there we also utilize this data-driven uh, non-parametric quantile estimation that we were, were utilizing for this comparison of marginal products and marginal costs. And then to access the dynamics, then we, then we will utilize structural change decompositions of productivity. So first of all, we, we, we apply uh, 
extended all opaque decomposition that also takes into account not only the allocation of resources, but also entry, exit, and switching of industry. And we apply it to labor productivity, but we also apply the similar decomposition to the, to the uh, assess carbon productivity and look at the structural changes and impact of structural changes on, on, on uh, greenhouse gas emission abatement. But that I will only, only touch upon briefly at the, at the end. So throughout this, our, our project, we have used the uh, used, uh, uh, firm level registered data from the Statistics Finland database. So it's officially called Financial Statement Data Panel. And uh, the time period for this, uh, this is, is years 2000 to 2018. So in this database, we, we observe virtually all, all business uh, firms uh, in Finland. So it is, it is uh, registered data. However, we will focus on the, on the business sector where, where this, uh, this, uh, measure, this data are considered to be more reliable. So we will exclude from the analysis all primary production. We also do not consider financial sector public administration and defense, uh, public education and, and uh, uh, activities of organizations or so extraterritorial organization and bodies. So we really focus on the, on, the, on the industries in the business sector. And then also from the outset, we have excluded housing companies, voluntary associations, foundations, pension funds, mortgage societies, and so on and so on. So that we really, really focus on, uh, on um, from genuine uh, business companies. So the coverage, as I mentioned, is, 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 uh, is very good. So, so this, in this registered data, we, we would observe all, all types of, but we will really focus on the, on, the, on the business firms in the business sectors. So then let's go to the misallocation study. And, uh, First of all, how it is uh, usually done. So I have just in a few slides to briefly outline what is the usual approach in the in the literature. So the starting point is is this kind of usually this kind of model of a monopolistic competition, where firms are maximizing profit, and uh, the first only condition is that the marginal value product should be equal to marginal cost. So this is of course is this kind of uh, kind of at the firm level. The 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 uh, for the for the allocation of labor and capital. So so if um, consider for example if the if the marginal value product of labor is lower than its marginal cost. So that would suggest that the firm is using too little of labor input. So in, in the optimum, it should use more labor. And the opposite is case if the marginal value product is higher than the marginal cost. So in that case, then uh, then. Uh, um, or the other way around, if the marginal value product is higher than the marginal cost, then, 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 then you should use more, more of the resource to, to, to make it equal. And other way around, if the marginal value product is lower than the marginal cost, then it means that you have done too much of that. that. So therefore, we can compare this marginal value pro product and marginal cost, and later we will consider the ratios of the two. Typically that way that we have take the take the, the ratio of marginal cost to, to, to marginal product. So how it is usually then, then uh, done, of course, notice that the, neither the marginal product nor the marginal cost are directly observable. So the usual approach in the literature is to proxy the marginal cost by, by the average unit cost of the firm. So this will take into account that there may be, may be differences in the, in the quality of the labor and capital resources across firms. So these quality differences would be reflected in this average unit costs. But of course, it doesn't take into account this kind of, uh, uh, that how much the, uh, the marginal cost might be when, when you would be hiring a next unit of, of labor or, or capital. Anyway, that's, that's the best that we can do in terms of the data. Regarding the marginal products, usually then, uh, then uh, researchers estimate, uh, estimate the production function, and typically it's, it's uh, using the Cobb-Douglas uh, functional form. So then this, uh, we have this uh, 
a single parameter to represent the, the output elasticities, which can be then used to calculate the estimated marginal value products. And then having estimated this uh, production functions, then usually then researchers then uh, present the counterfactual that uh, uh, and, and try to estimate how much output would increase if, uh, if all firms would equate uh, marginal value product and marginal cost. So this counterfactual is also then a, an important part of the uh, part of the analysis of the misallocation. So we will we will be first uh, in the first part we will just compare these uh, marginal products and marginal costs, and then then we will do this counterfactual analysis. But uh, we do not follow the common common approach. We we try to suggest some some improvements to this uh, to this approach. So first of all, in the estimation of uh, marginal products or marginal value products. So notice that if you think about the usual kind of kind of regression model, and I do not take logs now, but I, I do it in the in the in the level. So you, you might think about this uh, this uh, f of l and k as, as the Cobb Douglas production function, but it in, in general it can be just any any production function without any parametric specification. And uh, normally, like in the Cobb Douglas specification, then then the we have this um, error term of the regression model, uh, error term indicated by by epsilon, and this epsilon enters in the in the multiplicative fashion. So if we would then take logs of this equation, then we would have the usual kind of kind of uh, kind of uh, regression model for the Cobb Douglas production function, for example. But uh, notice here that if we take the marginal product of of output y. Uh, and uh, with respect to labor L and, and capital uh, capital K, so we take partial derivatives. Notice that uh, that um, we would have then this uh, this um, uh, this effective marginal products are dependent on this error term epsilon. So it's not only that. I mean, this is very similar to the to the usual type of. Uh, endogeneity problem in the estimation of the of the of the mod, of the production function this about Marshall Marsha can Andrews type of argument but our argument here is that it's not enough to to address the endogeneity in the in the estimation of the production function notice that the realization of the epsilon influences the the marginal products uh, even even if we take into account this endogeneity and the estimation of the of the of the uh, of the of the production function, the marginal products are still dependent on the realization of the epsilon. So this is why uh, our approach differs in that we do not just try to correct for the for the bias in the in the production function. Rather, we will resort to local estimation of marginal products using using quantiles. And we will utilize the so-called convex quantile regression, which is a fully non-parametric approach that doesn't specifically assume any, any particular functional form for the production function. And it can take into account this, uh, this, uh, this um, impact of the, of, the, of the error term epsilon. So we have earlier used this kind of quantile regression approach uh, when we have estimated marginal abatement costs of, of uh, uh, carbon dioxide or, or greenhouse gases. So this, this slide takes an illustrative figure from, uh, from uh, our recent paper with, uh, with Shun Shao in, in Ijor, where we, where we estimated the, the, the shadow prices for the, for the greenhouse gases using the similar kind of non-parametric convex quantile regression approach. So this this diagram can help to illustrate also what is the what is, what we do here. So rather than estimate just a single production function, we we estimate actually ten different deciles of the of the of the productivity distribution. And if you think about this uh, this um, this um, we we will utilize this kind of uh, piecewise linear. Uh, concave production functions, which satisfy this kind of uh, uh, usual kind of axioms for the production functions. 
So, so this kind of piecewise linear linear functions we also can utilize them for for estimating the marginal product. So notice that the marginal product is is constant over a certain interval, and then it then it changes. So the slope of this uh, this piecewise linear line indicates the the marginal product. And observe from this figure that this uh, this uh, slope of course depends on the level of uh, level of productivity. So for different deciles of the productivity distribution. Uh, the slopes are different, and, and notice particularly that for this high productivity. So, if we think of the most highest uh, highest decile, this uh, this um, slope is much higher than if you if you compare it to the to the to the bottom uh, productivity where the, where it's relatively flat. So, this is of course relevant in the context of marginal abatement cost because if you have a, a low productivity producer. The marginal abatement cost is much lower than if you are such kind of high productivity producer. But the same is also true, of course, when we think about the marginal products of labor and capital as well. So this approach can take into account this uh, productivity differences uh, uh, in, in between the firms. And, uh, and uh, we, we therefore utilize this kind of 10 different deciles for local estimation of the, of the marginal products. And this is, of course, in, in multiple dimensions. We have labor and capital. And so we have labor capital and, and value added as our variables. So how do we do this, uh, this computation? So we utilize this, uh, this kind of Py Python package called PyStone, which has been uh, developed by, by particularly Sheng Dai, my, my, my uh, uh, doctoral student. And then we have also, also um, collaborators from Taiwan, uh, uh, Mr. Fang and Professor, Professor Li. And this, uh, this Python package is actually freely available if you're interested. So, so the first link here on this slide gives this uh, uh, code and documentation. And then the other one is the working paper that is also describing this uh, this uh, Python package. So in this uh, in this project for the for the prime minister's office that I have described, so we asked the Statistics Finland to first of all install this uh, this uh, Python package to the to the Statistics Finland server, and uh, then our our. Uh, collaborators at Etla, so so they could uh, they could run this Python uh, using the Stata's um, uh, Stata Python uh, integration. So so all this kind of uh, data processing was done in Stata, but also then these Etla researchers can can run our code using using Stata that they are familiar with, uh, which is which is very very convenient. And this is how we can then get this uh, this uh, this. Uh, Relatively computationally intensive, also also convex quantile regression implemented in practice. So let me then get to the empirical application, and indeed first uh, first task is to compare these marginal products and marginal costs. And for for this this part of the analysis, we have selected uh, sixteen industries, eight industries from manufacturing and eight from other, other industries, including services. And uh, we wanted to do this in the, at, the, at the industry level. So we have, we have treated these 16 industries completely separately because we believe that, 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 uh, that this kind of uh, production functions, even though we, we consider heterogeneity in terms of this, uh, these quantiles or deciles, if you like, uh, any, anyway, that these technologies are so, so different in different industries. And uh, we selected industries where we, we believe that the, the, the um, products that they produce are relatively homogeneous. And also, also we selected industries where we could have reasonably large sample size. So we also pay attention to, in this part of the analysis, to three specific years. So we took the first year in our sample, 2005, uh, or, or year before the, the, let's say, the year just before the, the financial crisis. Then we took two, 2012, which is in the in the middle of the of the uh, Great Recession, and the latest year 2018. So I'm not going to to go through each each of these 16 industries in detail. I, I just show you some highlights. And firstly, let's think about the manufacture of basic metals. 
So this is, of course, relatively uh, relatively uh, homogeneous uh, industry in some sense. And um, here on this table, I have these uh, three different years in coal that we have considered. In the top part of the of the uh, of this table, we have the the labor unit, sorry, labor input, which would be would be euros per worker per year, and uh, we we can compare the unit cost and marginal product. The unit cost, uh, average unit cost, is is uh, representing in our thinking this this marginal cost. As as I mentioned, this is a common approach in the in the literature. Then in the middle part we have capital, and then then the bottom part we take the ratio of uh, of uh, of unit cost and marginal product. So in this particular industry, we find that this this um, averages of the of the unit costs and and the estimated marginal products are reasonably close to each other. So there is some some deviations, but not any kind of systematic. Uh, buyers some years uh, unit costs are lower than marginal products some years it is other way around but but this is the in industry where this uh, this uh, i mean this is something that we would expect to see if there if the uh, if there is not any any systematic misallocation same is true for the capital also if you think about this so i think the unit would be euro per euro euro so in some sense it's rate of return and uh, and uh, this kind of observed uh, observed uh, unit cost uh, comes also relatively close to the marginal product in terms of capital. So one more point: How do we actually calculate these unit costs? Uh, so so um, we we resort to the the functional distribution of income, and and of course then the value added of the firm is is divided to the to the to the labor costs and capital costs. So the labor cost is, is easier to observe. We observe the wages and, and other employer expenses. So, so, so this is how this unit cost of labor, so it takes into account uh, wages and indirect uh, uh, employer costs. And then for the capital, we take the difference of the, of the uh, value added and the, the labor costs. So that's then the part that, uh, that goes to the capital, whether it's equity or debt, but it's, it's the compensation for capital. And uh, so he also, if you, if you then consider this uh, ratio, so remember that always when, I, when we I will use the ratios, it's the ratio of unit costs and marginal products. And here we, we see again that, that it's relatively, Relatively close to one, especially in two thousand five. So the so the fact that it's it's less than one uh, would suggest that that for example, if you look at the marginal products, the marginal products are somewhat higher than the unit cost. So if this ratio of unit cost to marginal product is lower than one, then it means that it would make sense to increase this uh, this utilization of the resource process. So invest more in capital and, and hire more workers in 2005. But then it changes in 2012 and 2018 a little bit. So in, in 2012, for example, then we observed that uh, that marginal product of capital is already much lower than, 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 than the unit cost. So that would suggest that there was overcapacity in that particular year, where in 2018, it's, it's the other way around. <clears throat> Now then we consider another industry, the construction of uh, residential and non-residential buildings. And here we observe a little bit more typical uh, situation also in the other, other 16 or other, other 15 industries. So notice that in the construction industry, if you think about labor, first of all, then, then the marginal product of labor is much higher than the, than the unit cost. So that suggests that that that, uh, that uh, uh, it would it would make sense to hire more workers to the construction industry. Potential explanation might be that there's shortage of uh, of skilled uh, skilled workers that the construction industry could utilize. So this could be one one potential explanation. Then, we, if we look at the the capital, we see the other way around that unit costs are much higher than the than the marginal product. 
So this is what I mean if I, if I talk about this kind of systematic capital bias, is that when we compare this ratio of unit costs and marginal products, uh, we see that the unit costs of, of labor are less than one. And this is in, in the construction industry that has been this all these three years consistently so, whereas unit cost of capital is much higher than one and, and consistently throughout these three years. So yes, as I mentioned, it might be that, uh, that, uh, that there is shortage of skilled labor, but then this uh, capital bias that there is so much uh, overcapacity uh, might, might also suggest uh, towards this kind of market power explanation of uh, similar to, to Jan de Locker's result, this kind of increasing markups. And indeed, in many other industries that we have considered, the situation is more like this of the construction industry and less like that of the basic metals industry. So another piece of evidence that points to some systematic distortions, which might be a sign of, of market power, is when we do this kind of regression model. We, in these regression models, we have then uh, used as the dependent variable this, this, uh, this ratio of, of, uh, of uh, marginal cost and marginal product. So in other words, we proxy marginal co product cost by unit cost. So we have done this separately for, the, for the each industry. But, uh, but the situation is surprisingly similar across industries. So we might actually later on pool these different industries to a common, common regression model and then put some kind of industry dummies to, to, to capture heterogeneity of industries. But so far we have done this separately for each industry. So here's the, uh, here's the regression of the uh, marginal cost and marginal product ratio of labor for the manufacture of basic metals. So notice that, uh, that uh, uh, we have then used some kind of firm characteristics as exploratory variables. And, and we find that there are some, some systematic, uh, statistically significant association between uh, uh, this um, unit cost and marginal product ratio and, and firm age, uh, number of employees, equity to debt ratio that, that, uh, that considers the leverage, and foreign ownership, but also, also the year dummies. So remember that, that, that in most of the cases, this, uh, this ratio of unit cost and marginal product was less than one. So it appears that, uh, that the older the firm is, then, then they pay, pay higher, higher, higher wages uh, relative to the, to the labor productivity. Also larger firms pay, pay higher wages, and then interestingly, um, more leveraged firms seem to pay higher, higher wages and, and foreign owned firms pay higher wages relative to the, to the Finnish firms. When, as, when we, we take also this, uh, um, this marginal product into account. The situation is surprisingly similar when we go to other industries. Well, here's the same similar table for the construction of residential and non-residential buildings. So we also similarly find that, uh, and remember that in the construction industry, this, uh, this uh, particularly this labor ratio was typically much slower than one. So, so there was this kind of shortage of skilled labors in, lab workers in the construction industry. So here in construction industry, we also find that, uh, that uh, the older firms pay, pay higher wages relative to the marginal product. Uh, larger firms pay better, uh, more leveraged firms pay better, and foreign-owned firms pay higher wages. And this is very similar also was in this previous case of basic metals and, and also in other industries that we have considered, we find the similar kind of pattern. But this only holds for the labor input. For the capital input, we do not find anything significant. And we do not find any significant correlation between this, uh, this uh, this uh, uh, marginal cost, marginal product ratio, and this kind of firm characteristics, and uh, this seems to suggest then that there is this kind of kind of distortions are more systematic for the for the labor rather than than capital. So it it, it's, it seems that the, it's labor input that is is uh, uh, mainly misallocated. So then another part of the question is then that 
how much the productivity could increase if you, if you had uh, if you could allocate the resources better so those were kind of this uh, tentative uh, suggestions that uh, that kind of tended to to point towards this uh, this uh, potentially market power but there's potentially many other explanations as well but then how much could the productivity increase through better allocation so we now do this counterfactual using an optimization problem that we could think about it as a as a so it's kind of social planners optimization problem. So we think about this kind of counterfactual scenario where, where some kind of social planner would then take these resources and allocate them as, as, as optimally as possible. And we consider two types of constraints. So we, we first of all need to have some kind of technology constraints. And here we utilize this uh, estimated quantiles or we have these 10 deciles of the productivity distribution. And those are, are the technology constraints that need to be satisfied. And then another important constraint is that the total resources of the, of the industry, so the total uh, labor input and total capital input of the indus industry do not change. So it's, it's uh, just purely reallocating these resources that exist uh, or currently available. So therefore, if uh, if uh, reallocation can increase uh, output in terms of value added, then when the total resources do not change, then then this increase in value added is also directly also increase in labor productivity and also it is increase in the total productivity. So this kind of percentage increase in the value added also directly indicates what is the percentage increase in in productivity because the, the resources do not change at the industry level. So notice that the, the, the firm level resources can be reallocated, but the industry level, there is same amount of resources remain. So, so if we, if we uh, increase the resources for one firm, it means that some other firm needs to do with less resources in that case. And in this kind of counterfactual, comparison, we will consider actually five different scenarios. One of the uh, counterfactual is actually just purely random allocation. So in the random allocations, we just uh, draw two random numbers from the uniform distribution and use those uh, to, to get the, the firm's shares of labor and capital. And then we just uh, allocate capital and labor to the firms based on these randomly drawn shares. And then we then we repeat this kind of random allocation several several times, and then we take the mean and the median of the resulting resulting output. But then in those other other scenarios, we then do this kind of social social planners optimization, and we also consider different different scenarios. So starting from more restrictive cases, uh, in the in the first two optimization pro problems. Uh, we only allocate capital and labor within each decile, meaning that we cannot, uh, uh, in, this would be the situation that, uh, that uh, there are so large uh, productivity differences uh, in these 10 different deciles that, uh, and, and perhaps these kind of productivity differences are, are to do with the quality of the labor and capital. For example, the, the, the most productive firms would have more more better quality or more educated workers, for example, and uh, we cannot just uh, uh, increase the output of these top deciles by bringing bringing some kind of less educated workers from the bottom deciles. So we only allocate resources within each decile. And then these last two two scenarios, we we relax that assumptions and we also al allow for reallocation. Uh, between deciles, so we would also have the possibility to uh, move more resources from less productive firms to more productive firms, and this uh, we use that to boost productivity growth. So then another another is this exit or no exit uh, in these different scenarios. So this refers to the possibility that can the social planner um, uh, drive out some of the current firms from the market. So the, if, if we say that exit is allowed, it means that uh, the social planner in this counterfactual scenarios can just allocate zero resources to the firm. And that means that effectively this firm 
uh, doesn't participate in the market anymore. In the no exit scenarios, uh, we are forced to allocate some resources even to the even to the most inefficient firms. So all of the firms are, are required to have sufficient resources to to continue to operate. Okay, so let me a little bit first um, illustrate that how this uh, optimal allocations then look like. And I will I will use these two cases of what we have seen before. So so left part of this uh, this uh, table is uh, manufacture of basic metals. And the right part is, is the construction industry. So first of all, how do these optimal allocations look like? And this is the scenario where we can uh, reallocate both within and between deciles, but no exit is allowed. So this is very, very illustrative of this, how this, uh, how this reallocation works when we allow for the, for the, for the reallocation also between deciles. So, Here's also this uh, in this table. So I have plotted here this, uh, these uh, 10 different deciles. And, and uh, in this table, these numbers indicate the, uh, the percentage share of the total, total resources. So each column, labor capital and output, they sum to, sum to one. OK. And, uh, and decile number one, it, it indicates we can, we can think about it as this kind of uh, decile of of 90 percent to 100 percent of, of uh, efficiency so this is the most product productive firms then decile number two we can think about it that these are firms that operate with 80 to 90 percent efficiency third decile is firms with 70 to 80 and so forth and the bottom decile 10 is then this kind of uh, bottom 10 percent of the efficiency distribution so obviously if we allow this kind of reallocation of resources from this bottom uh, least uh, efficient industries to the most efficient industries, it makes sense to allocate more resources to the most efficient ones. However, interestingly, in this in the social planners optimization problem, then then it turns out that it's not optimal to put all the resources to the to the most efficient firms. So, in fact, in both these industries. Uh, uh, the the top three deciles all receive a lot of uh, a lot of resources. Or in fact, there is this uh, construction industry. The fourth decile gets also a sizable proportion of the of the of the resources. And this is because in our this uh, quantile production functions, there is uh, uh, variable returns to scale. So so first there is increasing returns to scale, and then it uh, there is some optimal scale size, and then it uh, becomes decreasing returns to scale. So when the decreasing returns to scale uh, hit in, then it makes makes more sense to let start to allocate resources to the second tier and third tier of this uh, of this uh, deciles. And notice also these were the scenarios with this uh, no exit. So in the in the basic metals industry, we have some uh, even even these uh, least efficient uh, um, least efficient uh, deciles get some resources, but but it's so little that it, it rounds to zero percent of the of the of the of the total total industry. In the construction industry, it's more evident that uh, that even the bottom deciles are producing at least one percent of the of the total total output of the industry. So it would mean that that this uh, that uh, we could still have some kind of small niche firms uh, which which are relatively inefficient but still continue to operate. And and this also indicates that okay if we, if we have this kind of forced exit uh, possibility so even if the social planner could then then force this kind of very small firms in this bottom deciles to 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 uh, leave the the industry then the impact is relatively small because you notice that even if if this more firm, uh, there there is this kind of small fraction of resources allocated to this uh, very inefficient firms it doesn't make a big difference to the to the optimal allocation okay so therefore this uh, exit or no exit doesn't make surprisingly little difference when when we when we uh, quantify these results. So then, here is then then uh, these two tables indicate for the for these two two industries then how large potential increase in the output could be in these different different uh, 
scenario. So, so again, we have these two, two illustrative industries. Here we have these columns are now these years 2005, 2012, and 2018. The first row indicates what's the value added of the industry in the current allocation. Okay. Then the second two to compare them to the purely random allocation. So we had this kind of case that we just uh, completely randomly draw some, some uh, uh, firm shares of the resources, and then we allocated the resources just randomly and see how much output would be then, then produced. And interestingly, in these, uh, these um, years 2005 and 2012, actually, actually there is uh, uh, very little difference. However, in 2018, we see that the random allocations actually generate more value added than the, than the current allocation, which is quite, quite worrying that our, our current allocation is not even competitive to just purely random allocation. So in some sense, if we just hired some monkeys to allocate the resources, they would probably do a better job than, than our, our manufacturing and construction industry which is really worrying. So we use these random allocations to also indicate that, that, that really then compared to this kind of uh, social planners optimum, this current allocation is really a far cry from, from the optimal allocation. And uh, we have the scenarios within, within this allocation. Uh, if you look at the basic metals, in 2005, there was 40%. Uh, potential increase if we had uh, that uh, that kind of uh, within decile allocation. In 2012, it goes to 75, and then in 2018, it's more than 125. And if we also allow for the for the allocation between deciles, then we are more than 100 percent already in 2005, and it further further increases. So this is the, of course the typical pattern that that remember that this within decile allocation allows only that, that we can reallocate resources between firms at the similar level of efficiency. So within this, uh, this uh, performance decile. And, and of course, we, we will get more output if it, if, if it is possible to switch resources from low productivity firms to, to to high productivity firms, but this within decile allocation doesn't doesn't even allow for that, and still we have a, a very large potential gains, especially in the basic metals industry. Uh, in the construction industry, it's actually not so bad. So so this also shows that there are big differences uh, between industries. So then the next question is that what do, what do we know about then the improvement or deterioration over time? So based on the previous table, uh, we saw at least in the basic metals some signs of deteriorating allocation over time. So now in this last part of the, of the study, we, we then look at the all industries of the business sector and we try to gain insight by looking at so-called structural change decompositions of, of labor productivity. So this is based on the seminal work of Oli and Bakes, uh, which, which takes into account this kind of uh, allocation component. But then we also then have an extension where we can also, also look at entry and exit and industry switching. And this is based on the, on the recent paper with, uh, with Natalia Kosman. And in this exercise, of, of course, like I mentioned, we, we consider the entire business sector of Finland. We have also then uh, analyzed it separately for, for at, at, at the industry level, but I will only consider this whole business sector. And we have, we have divided this time period 2000 to 2018 to three sub periods. So we consider 2000 to 2005 as this period before the financial crisis. Then from 2006 to 2012, we got this period of the Great Recession. And then from 2013 to 2018, we, we call it follow-up recession and slow recovery. So one reason for this kind of division of, of sub-periods is that uh, 
actually there was some some changes in this uh, in this uh, statistics Finland data. So from from year two thousand five to two thousand six, for example, the data are not uh, uh, strictly so comparable, and there was similar kind of uh, data revision from two thousand twelve to two thousand thirteen. So this is one one of the reasons why we have these three sub sub periods. Another is that this this uh, this actually are quite uh, quite. Uh, distinct periods so this uh, we, we see that this uh, this uh, productivity uh, productivity growth behaved very differently during this great recession compared to the period before and period after and finally when we when we look into this kind of uh, structural changes like entry exit and industry switching uh, it is good to have a little bit longer period than just one calendar year to really, really have this kind of kind of um, uh, sufficient time for this kind of kind of uh, structural changes in the in the industry. So this is why we argue that this kind of three period or three sub periods it is useful for our purposes. So one note about the the measurement of productivity before we proceed. So so um, there is. Um, Mm. This concerns about the aggregation of labor productivity. So, so we are interested now at the sector level productivity, but uh, this kind of structural change components and allocation, of course, occurs at the firm level. So this is why it is very important that we manage to co consistently aggregate this firm level productivity to industry level. And uh, here I have outlined this, this formula. So we, we we, we can measure the, the labor productivity simply as the ratio of value added and labor input, both at the, the firm level and at the industry level. But to have consistent aggregation, then uh, we need to take a share, share weighted average or, or weighted sum, if you like, of this, of this uh, uh, firm level productivity, so lowercase p. And uh, it's easy to see that the, that the appropriate shares Appropriate share weights are the are the labor share. So the, the share of the labor input of firm I in the total labor of the of the industry. So this is something that uh, unfortunately in, in, in many productivity studies, this consistent aggregation is not really paid enough attention. And surprisingly common mistake, for example, is that uh, that when people uh, like to use the logs. Then, then they take a share weighted um, or, or share weighted average or sum of the log productivities of the firms. However, this is not uh, not uh, correct because the the um, because the uh, weighted sum of logs log productivities is not the same as as uh, uh, log productivity of the of the weighted sum. So, so this is. I believe this is. This can make a big, big this kind of aggregation error, if if one uses the the share weight weighted sum of the of the log productivities. But you notice this kind of errors in even in some some uh, articles in the top journals. So we of course avoid this kind of kind of uh, aggregation error in our our study. So. What do we do then? So how does that this uh, this kind of structural change decomposition relate to the to the allocation that we have considered and misallocation? So the starting point is this Oli Pake's uh, decomposition, where they they show that that, that the industry productivity, so this uh, this capital P, we can write in two parts. So it would be the average, so it would be unweighted average of the firms. So that kind of kind of uh, reflects this kind of average productivity. And, and then, then there's this other component which captures the reallocation. And uh, there is different ways to write it, but we can think about the second component as the, as the sample covariance of the share weights and, and this, uh, this productivity. And uh, well, why this kind of covariance term is important for the allocation? So, Oli and Pakes uh, pay a lot of attention to to justify that that, that why why more productive uh, firms would then then uh, uh, invest more and then this kind of shares 
would would then then also also become correlated with this this uh, this productivities over time so so it, it, of course this kind of kind of um, um industry level productivity would be higher if there is positive correlation between the shares and and productivity so high productivity firms get larger share of the industry resources so this is the the rationale for this kind of looking at this kind of reallocation effect and then what we do this kind of when i mentioned that we use an extended version of the decomposition then we will actually then break down this average productivity this this uh, p upper bar and and this this one we we will then then uh, break down to the subgroups of firms we, we consider uh, firms that uh, continue to operate in the in the same industry then we look at the firms that switch industries and they look at this entry and exit of firms so that's in our view a natural way to expand this olean base uh, to to take into account also the impacts of entry and exit and uh, and real uh, and industry switching so to this end in the following table first of all then then uh, uh, in this this table uh, we have the reported just the average levels of labor productivity so here there is no decomposition yet we just compare the average le levels of labor productivity and uh, by group type so so we have here this uh, in this table this uh, three sub periods we have the first year and the last year and then then in this uh, left part of the table we have these four groups so we have the firms that uh, continue to operate in the same industry then we have a uh, second column is with, with labeled industries which indicates firms that continue to operate but switch industry between this period in the first time it, between 2000 and 2005 so then we have this exit group so for the exit group we only observe this uh, this level of productivity at the beginning of the period so for example in year 2000 but because they do not uh, continue to operate till 2005 so then then we have a missing value there uh, the a similar situation is for the entering group so so this entry group these firms uh, did not exist in year 2000 but in 2005 they have entered uh, the, the in the production and then we have also on the right side of the picture we have also the percentage shares of this of these different different groups in each year so for example in year 2000 this uh, this group of uh, firms that continue to operate in the same industry was 65 percent approximately 4.5 uh, um, firms of the uh, switch to another industry and 30.7 uh, uh, percent of the, those firms observed in year 2000 uh, uh, left the market by 2005 so there are several interesting observations so if you first of all look at this this group shares notice that there is quite a lot of turnover of in terms of entry and exit so so something of the magnitude of uh, one third of the firms are leaving and entering in this kind of uh, five six seven year period that we, we observed so this is kind of it suggests that there is not really um, a lot of problem with the entry entry dynamics Although in 2000, this last period, 2013, 2018, this uh, this entry rate actually decreased. So that's that's uh, maybe maybe a sign of this kind of decrease in business dynamism. Notice also this industry switching. It's it's relatively marginal in the last year, but during this kind of period, which we label the Great Recession, there was uh, almost nine percent uh, uh, from firms in 2006 switched to another industry so during this kind of uh, more turbulent time there was more switching of industry which suggests that it might be might be this kind of um, a survival strategy rather than a response to some some new business opportunities then if you look at the look at the levels uh notice that uh, that if you look at for example this exit and entry groups then then we see that uh, the the new firms that enter the market are always always much more productive than the exiting firms 
especially so in this 2018 compared to 2013. Also, if we compare the exit group and the, the same industry, it is this kind of low productivity firms that tend to tend to exit. In the industry switching group, there is some some uh, differences. So typically, then then we see in the first and the last sub period, there's some some productivity growth in the in the switching group. However, the situation is is worse in this in this middle 2006 to 2012 period. And then on the bottom of the period, you can get also some idea of the sample sizes. So we had more than 200,000 observations in this, in this, uh, this, uh, in the business sector. So now this was this kind of levels. It's good to keep in mind that how these levels are operating. Uh, what about then this productivity change? So this is, of course, we are, we are interested in these decompositions. So applying this kind of extended olive decomposition we get this kind of results so again we have these three sub periods and and uh, this table then reports the average yearly change in labor productivity so we have this kind of kind of uh, in the first period there's maybe maybe a bit modest positive growth in the business sector as a whole middle period there is there is a productivity decline and then relatively good productivity growth in the in the last uh, last years. And then if you look at them in in components, so so first of all, if you look at the continuing firms in the same industry, there was reasonably good good growth in the in the first sub periods. We turned to the negative one in the in the during the Great Recession, and then again quite quite fast growth from two thousand thirteen to two thousand eighteen. The industry switching had, had relatively uh, or had similar kind of kind of uh, kind of uh, signs, but relatively small contribution. Uh, also, entry and exit effect. Uh, it had positive contribution in every every period, but notice that particularly high in the last uh, last sub period. So we had this kind of very productive firms entering in this last uh, last uh, sub period. But notice that this uh, particularly uh, interesting result is that this uh, last component, the reallocation, which is the main focus or, or main topic of this of this our study. So that was negative throughout these uh, three sub periods, and especially in the last uh, period, there's very large negative effect that practically uh, cancels out this positive development of the entry and exit effect and this uh, strong performance of the continuing firms. So this is this is then then indicates that indeed it is this kind of uh, resource misallocation is an important explanation for this uh, productivity slowdown at the aggregate level. Notice that there has been very very positive development in the, those at the firm level in those firms that continue to operate and also those that e enter the market. So it's particularly the strong entry also that, that explains why this uh, reallocation component is so badly negative. So if I go back to this previous uh, figure, now let's pay attention to the lowest uh, line with this 2018. So notice that here is this kind of average productivity level of the entry group is very, very high. It's even, even two times higher than this uh, this group of, of uh, continuing firms in the same industry. But of course, these firms that enter the market, they tend to be small. And, uh, and uh, the, then, then this kind of correlation between this high productivity versus small share of labor, then is, is explaining that there is this uh, fast deterioration in this, in this reallocation component. So then in the coming years, it is of course then then interesting to see, do these small firms start to grow? Do this kind of uh, new high productivity firms uh, start to employ or not? And uh, this is the question that we, we cannot, cannot uh, quite, quite see yet. But, uh, but uh, of course, according to this kind of, kind of um, uh, in the competitive market, then of course, if you have such kind of high productivity advantage in this new entrance, 
then they should start to attract workers and grow and, and hire more more workers interesting of course is that just this kind of optimization perhaps robotization uh then uh, encourage these new firms to to actually not hire more workers so this is then interesting to see that does this reallocation effect become more more reasonable in the in the future but but this confirms our 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 view that that, that indeed it is this kind of deteriorating allocation that uh, that has slowed down the productivity growth good thing is that that uh, that uh, there is huge potential to increase productivity and this kind of uh, productivity dynamics in terms of entry and exit, but also the, the, the growth of the continuing firms looks to be in, in the relatively healthy basis. So finally, I refer to this, uh, this potential um, mismeasurement explanation for the, for the slow productivity growth, just to illustrate it, we have also compared the carbon productivity in Finland and also we applied similar kind of structural change decomposition, not only to labor productivity, but also to the carbon productivity. And uh, here, just to illustrate it, this is the, the uh, this is based on Eurostat. So we have this kind of index of labor productivity indicated here on the, using the black solid line. And then the blue line indicates the development of carbon productivity. So notice that since 2010, there has been a huge growth of the, of the carbon productivity, whereas labor productivity has been stagnated like, like we know at the, at the aggregate level. So, so like I mentioned already before, of course, this carbon productivity increase doesn't come by itself, it, it, it requires a lot of resources, in particular, huge, huge uh, uh, capital investment. So if we think about this kind of counterfactual, that suppose that, uh, that we didn't have this, uh, this uh, uh, problem with the climate change. So suppose that we didn't need to invest in this uh, carbon mitigation, then all of these resources could have been a channel to, to improving labor productivity instead of carbon productivity. So obviously, this fact that, uh, that that there has been massive investment in uh, uh, in the abatement of greenhouse gases, it must 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 have some kind of opportunity cost. And uh, obviously, these kind of conventional measures of productivity, including labor productivity and capital productivity, they fail to capture this kind of kind of uh, kind of uh, allocation of of capital to this uh, greenhouse gas abatement. So this may be one of these kind of uh, um, mismeasurement type of explanations that can also partly, partly shed light to this kind of uh, uh, stagnation of labor productivity and partly also this kind of stagnation of the measured uh, economic growth because this kind of uh, progress in terms of uh, greenhouse gas, greenhouse gases is not captured by the, by the conventional measures of, of value added. So perhaps if we, if we look at some kind of uh, uh, green growth and green productivity growth, we would see also some more positive development. So in some sense, uh, of course, at this hour time, this, this addressing the climate change is really the existential challenge. So I do not say that, uh, that this kind of counterfactual scenario without this kind of abatement is any, anything desirable, but it is just, uh, just uh, that, uh, that uh, why it is kind of or what it, this is anyway just one potential explanation that why this uh, conventionally measured uh, labor productivity and total productivity fail to capture this kind of kind of progress in this uh, uh, in this dimension so like i mentioned if you're interested in the, in the in the report there is also this kind of structural change decomposition of the of the carbon productivity which i believe is also something something quite uh, uh, interesting and novel. I haven't seen this kind of structural change decompositions applied to the carbon productivity before. But uh, my presentation today then, then uh, comes to an end. So thank you very much to the, your attention. And uh, if you have any, any questions, you can, you can contact me by email or, or, or if you are present in Turku, you can, you can, you can then 
then ask. So anyway, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed and and uh, and uh, well, see you next time. Bye bye.